Jim Rickards, New Reality of China's Failing Economy is Coming Soon. I've written for years that Chinese economic development is partly real and partly smoke and mirrors, and that it's critical for investors to separate one from the other to make any sense out of China and its impact on the world. My longest piece on this topic was Chapter 4 of my second book, The Death of Money, 2014, but I've written much else besides, including many articles for my newsletters. There's no denying China's remarkable economic progress over the past 30 years. Hundreds of millions have escaped poverty and found useful employment in manufacturing or services in the major cities. Infrastructure gains have been historic, including some of the best trains in the world, state-of-the-art transportation hubs, cutting-edge telecommunications systems, and a rapidly improving military. Yet, that's only half the story. The other half is pure waste, fraud, and theft. About 45% of Chinese GDP is in the category of investment. A developed economy GDP such as the US is about 70% consumption and 20% investment. There's nothing wrong with 45% investment in a fast-growing developing economy assuming the investment is highly productive and intelligently allocated. That's not the case in China. At least half of the investment there is pure waste. It takes the form of ghost cities that are fully built with skyscrapers, apartments, hotels, clubs, and transportation networks and are completely empty. This is not just Western propaganda, I've seen the ghost cities firsthand and walked around the empty offices and hotels. Chinese officials try to defend the ghost cities by claiming they are built for the future. That's nonsense. Modern construction is impressive, but it's also high maintenance. Those shiny new buildings require occupants, rents and continual maintenance to remain shiny and functional. The ghost cities will be obsolete long before they are ever occupied. Other examples of investment waste include over-the-top white elephant public structures such as train stations with marble facades, 128 escalators, mostly empty, 100-foot ceilings, digital advertising and few passengers. The list can be extended to include airports, canals, highways, and ports, some of which are needed and many of which are pure waste. Communist Party leaders endorse these wasteful projects because they have positive effects in terms of job creation, steel fabrication, glass installation, and construction. However, those effects are purely temporary until the project is completed. The costs are paid with borrowed money that can never be repaid. China might report 6.8% growth in GDP, but when the waste is stripped out the actual growth is closer to 4.5%. Meanwhile, China's debts grow faster than the economy and its debt-to-GDP ratio is even worse than the US. All of this would be sustainable if China had an unlimited ability to roll over and expand its debt and ample reserves to deal with a banking or liquidity crisis. It doesn't. China's financial fragility was revealed during the 2014-2016 partial collapse of its capital account. China had about $4 trillion in its capital account in early 2014. That amount had fallen to about $3 trillion by late 2016. Much of that collapse was due to capital flight for fear of Chinese devaluation, which did occur in August 2015 and again in December 2015. China's $3 trillion of remaining reserves is not as impressive as it sounds. $1 trillion of that amount is invested in illiquid assets, hedge funds, private equity funds, direct investments, etc. This is real wealth, but it's not available on short notice to defend the currency or prop up banks. Another $1 trillion of Chinese reserves are needed as a precautionary fund to bail out the Chinese banking system. Many observers are relaxed about the insolvency of Chinese banks because they are confident about China's ability to rescue them. They may be right about that, but it's not free. China needs to keep $1 trillion of dry powder to save the banks, so that money's off the table. That leaves about $1 trillion of liquid reserves to defend the Chinese currency, if so desired. At the height of the Chinese capital outflows in 2016, China was losing $80 billion per month of hard currency to defend the yuan. At that tempo, China would have burned through $1 trillion in one year and become insolvent. 
China did the only feasible thing, which was to close the capital account, interest rate hikes and further devaluation would have caused other more serious problems. This distress might have been temporary if China had managed to maintain good trading relations with the US. But that proved another chimera. The trade war, which has broken out between the US and China has damaged Chinese exports and raised costs on Chinese imports at exactly the time China was counting on a larger trade surplus to help it finance its mountain of debt. Now trade is drying up and China is stuck with debt it can't repay or roll over easily. This marks the end of China's Cinderella growth story, and the beginning of a period of economic slowdown and potential social unrest. The coming Chinese crack-up is not just theoretical. The hard data supports the thesis. Here's a real-time data summary from the Director of Floor Operations at the New York Stock Exchange, Stephen Sarge Guilfoyle, the greater threat to financial markets will come, in my opinion from the slowing of global growth at least partially due to the current state of international trade. This thought process is lent some credence by last night's rather disastrous across-the-board macroeconomic numbers released by China's National Bureau of Statistics. For the month of July, in China fixed asset investment dot growth slowed to the slowest pace since this data was first recorded back in 1992, printing in decline for a fifth consecutive month. Industrial Production Missed expectations for a third consecutive month, while printing at a growth rate equaling the nation's slowest since February of 2016. Retail sales. Finally showing a dent in the armor, missed expectation while slowing from the prior month. Unemployment. This item has only been recorded since January. Headline unemployment popped up to 5.1% from June's 4.8%. Oil production. The NBS reported that Chinese oil production fell 2.6% in July, and now stands from a daily perspective at the lowest level since June of 2011. China will not report Q3 GDP until October 15. The National Bureau of Statistics reported annualized growth of 6.7% for the second quarter. Depending on the veracity of the data, one must start to wonder if China can indeed hang on to growth of 6.5% going forward. This unpleasant picture Sarge paints is based on official Chinese data. Yet, China has a long history of overstating its data and painting the tape. The reality in China is always worse than the official data reveals. This slowdown comes just months after Chinese dictator Xi Jinping was offered a dictator for life role by the removal of term limits and was placed on the same pedestal as Mao Zedong by the creation of Xi Jinping thought as a formal branch of Chinese communist ideology. The Book of Proverbs says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Xi Jinping now finds himself in precisely this position. His political ascension inflated his pride just as he now faces the reality of a falling economy and possible destruction of any consensus around his power and the lack of accountability. Trump continues to tighten the screws with more tariffs, more penalties and a near-complete shutdown of China's ability to invest in U.S. markets. Turkey, Argentina and Venezuela are large developing economies that are in different stages of collapse and threaten the global economy with panic through contagion. Yet those three economies combined are not as large or important as China. Only Trump and XI can salvage the situation with negotiation and reasonable compromise on trade and intellectual property. But, Trump won't blink first, that's up to XI. So far, a spirit of compromise is not in the air. A spirit of Chinese collapse and contagion is. Regards, Jim Rickards Trump's $800 gift to Ford investors. When I was in high school, the only thing I really cared about was basketball. I wasn't very good at first, but I was extremely competitive. Of course, like most freshmen, I had to spend my time on the bench watching the upperclassmen take all the glory. I worked my butt off, but each game I got stuck sitting on the sidelines because I just wasn't good enough yet. Sitting on the sidelines was miserable. And honestly, I was a bit panicked in my teenage mind that I would be stuck there forever. That's probably what made me work so hard to get better so I could play in the big games when I was a junior and senior. Why do I bring this up to you today? 
because just like an awkward freshman watching the action from the sidelines, many investors are holding a lot of uninvested cash in their accounts and watching the market move higher. Of course, this is the exact script that we've been talking about for a while now. Last week, we were just starting to break to new highs on the S&P 500. And I told you that once the water was over the dam, we'd start to see investors who had been sitting on the sidelines put their capital to work. That sideline capital is what has been driving the markets higher this week. And it's about to get much more intense. You see, this weekend marks the official end of the summer season. We'll have the holiday weekend in observance of Labor Day, and then get back to work on Tuesday. On Wall Street, this is typically the time when the big shots come back to the office after spending the summer in the Hamptons. And when these investment managers get back in the office, they're typically ready to rock and roll. This year, the overwhelming question most of these guys will be asking is, do I have enough exposure? Or in other words, am I going to make enough money as this market moves higher? And keep in mind, as small-time investors call up their broker and say I want to get back into the market, this capital flows right to the funds managed by these big shots. So, just as these investment managers get back from vacation, they're going to be met with a lot of capital in their accounts in a market that is sprinting forward. So what exactly will they do? You guessed it. They're going to be buying stocks hand over fist. That's why I expect us to have a very strong September. And that's why I want to make sure that you are in a great spot to capitalize on this. There are plenty of opportunities for you to put your sideline cash to work before this trend kicks into full gear. One new opportunity that I'm watching closely is the decline of the US dollar. After rising quickly when the trade war broke out, the dollar has since receded on the heels of Trump making progress with Mexico. This is a trend that should continue as more deals are reached with Canada, the European Union and China in the future. So what's the best way to play a falling dollar? Invest in American companies that sell goods and services abroad like Ford, General Motors, and Procter and & Gamble. That's because these companies' overseas profits are now being converted back into more US dollars. Take for example Ford. Say Ford sells a car in Europe for 20,000 euros. Last week, before Trump's trade war calming Mexico news was released, the Euro-USD exchange rate sat at 1.13. That means that every euro was worth 1.13 US dollars, and a car sold in Europe for 20,000 euros would be converted back into $22,600 worth of revenue for Ford. But now, with trade war fears easing, the euro slash USD exchange rate has since spiked to 1.17, meaning the USD is weaker than it was last week. That now means that every 20,000 euros car gets converted back into $23,400 worth of revenue for Ford. That's an extra $800 in revenue per car. Keep in mind, nothing has changed about the car. Ford is simply benefiting from selling in the right place at the right time, which is why I recommend you buy your shares before the dollar gets any weaker. Here's to growing and protecting your wealth.